Absolutely. In other words, the British, when they, it goes back to history a little bit, when the British conquered India, they felt everywhere they conquered them, they had to try to prove to the world that that culture sucked, that it was really bad, and it was degenerating, it had degenerated, and uh, that they were therefore had the white man's burden to make it really nice and civilized. So in the history, in, the, in, that, in every area they did that. And, uh, but in, particularly in the area of uh, Buddhism, they, uh, first of all, they found out that the Indians didn't know anything about Buddhism. They completely forgot about it. And then second, um, they kind of, they themselves began to discover in Sri Lanka, actually not in India, but they began to discover uh, the Pali texts on Buddha, and Theravada Buddhism. And um, so they kind of liked that. Buddha was like Socrates, sort of. He had a, uh, he only wore an orange toga instead of a white one. And he was a monk, but, you know, he had been a prince. So they kind of liked that. It was kind of clean and nice, you know. Leave the world, attain enlightenment, and don't bother us. <laughs> As we extract the wealth of India, send it back to London. And uh, so that was the... They liked that. Then, when they started learning more about Indian Buddhism, from the Pau, they recently heard they began to learn about what the Padalama calls now the Sanskrit Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, and Vajrayana Buddhism. When they began to learn more about that, they thought it was horrible. First, they didn't like Mahayana because, you know, they didn't like Hinduism, and because Hinduism was, they said, polytheistic, which is actually not quite accurate. But anyway, Hinduism had lots of gods. And although really only one, the different versions only had one creator, so they were actually monotheistic. But still, British didn't like them, and they thought it was very kind of corrupt, and they had weird days with many arms and fierce faces sometimes. They just thought it was really creepy stuff, pagan, you know, stuff. And um, so they thought that was a big step down from the nice, clean Theravada, where they sort of no, supposedly no attention to magic or deities or anything. Which is actually even a distortion of Theravada Buddhism, but anyway, that's what they thought. And then when they got to Tantra, they really thought Buddhism had gone down the drain. Because Tantra, they didn't even know about Freud, right, in the unconscious. But what they thought of Tantra was, it was just sex and violence, you know, and some sort of excuse. And they already had a very, the Victorian British had a very snotty idea about the Indians. That they were all kind of very oversexed natives, you know. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you know, because they had ragas and they had, they had, um, you know, actually beautiful erotic art. And actually, they had basically their masters in Johnson about 1500 years earlier, <laughs> called the Kama Sutra. You know? And uh, so they had, so when they heard about Tantra, they thought that really is down the drain. That's the height of corruption. It's terrible. And um, all this stuff about sex and violence. And then, and the deities even in the, the male-female union. And then, so then when they heard about Tibet, so, because Tibet received from India, starting in the 7th century, 6th, 7th century, the Indian Buddhist teaching, which was the integrated, you know, monastic teaching, Mahayana, Bodhisattva teaching, and Vajrayana, and Vitaric teaching. So they received the three in Harmony, which actually is the way Buddha taught, taught them. But the Buddhists think that Buddha taught Vajrayana, and Buddha taught, always teaches Vajrayana, and Buddha teaches Mahayana, not just Theravada. He, he taught initially for a few hundred years, he, he felt Theravada should be emphasized to help India develop some sense of nirvana, liberation, individualism, various things. So to get away from the Vedic sacrificial culture. So, um, and come up with a more scientific and realistic culture. So, in other words, the talk I gave had to do with the fact that the Western scholars have tended to use the presence and existence of Tantra as something corrupt and decadent and no good. And even, and therefore, the whole, the, and one of their key things that they argue about is tantric, say, use of sexual union in tantric meditations of certain kinds. What is that about? And of course, they were assuming that some horny monks got tired of being monks and ran out in the bazaar somewhere and grabbed some girls and then went off and had some ritual. And that's, that was their assumption. You follow me? So in that light, 
I was saying that that's why this talk and where I was going to begin. I ended up, end up not beginning to talk with them this way. I just did it without a list of things because there was no time. But anyway, that's what I can tell you. So then Atishan, who, who, one of the greatest um, Indian masters who came to Tibet in the 11th century was called Atisha. And um, this is after the early period where Padmasambhava and Shantarakshita came. The chief monk of India and the chief yogi of India, chief tantric yogi of India, came in the 8th century. And then they did a lot of teaching and they planted the seeds of Buddhism at that time. But then the Tibetans reasserted their native thing, which was more shamanistic. And um, they didn't like that because Buddhism is nonviolent, basically, it's against war. And so they, and they lost their empire a little bit because of getting so into it because it was so great. And then they and then they re reasserted sort of the native thing which they called Ben. Although then Ben, which had previously been a royal thing in Tibet, imitated Buddhism rather completely, and so it's almost like a mirror image of Buddhism eventually. Yeah. Anyway, Buddhism then was out for about a hundred years, 150 years, and uh, from 840 to 845 to around 1000, <coughs> then of the common era, and then a new wave came in sort of a comprehensive way where Buddhism really took over basically all of Tibet slowly. And even the kings and everybody, and it became this mass, what I call a mass monastic society, unique on the planet, where you had 20% monks and nuns, which is a, a, absolutely unique. In Europe, even with Christian monastics, <coughs> never approached that level of people giving up all the accoutrements of the home life, of normal life. And living, because it was wealthy enough to that, the population was small enough, and they lived very comfortably off the wealth. Tibet never had a famine until it was conquered uh, by the Chinese in the 1950s. There was never a time when they had a famine. Because of the tremendous yaks, because of the yak. The yak is the great benefactor of Tibetan culture. Because there's a huge grassland, the yak eats the grass, and then they eat the yak, so they have the milk, the cheese, they use the skin of the yak, the fur of the yak, the yak is for their tents. I mean, the yak is just such a cool animal. And the yak, by the way, you should know this, the yak is very special because it doesn't bite the grass. It doesn't graze by biting the grass. In fact, it's a non-grazing bovine animal. The yak is a browsing, in agricultural terminology, it browses, like when you browse in a bookstore. <laughs> yeah. That's what the yak does. And how does it do that? It licks the grass, and the blade comes off the root, doesn't disturb the root in high altitude, fragile, Step. So that's why a yaks can survive at that altitude, and then Tibetans survive. They're very, very comfortable. Very nice. They took care of them, took care of their step beautifully. There's absolutely no question that it's a complete lie that Tibetans were overgrazing the, the, the steps, you know, and therefore had to be taken there. Yaks were taken away from them in the last 10 years. Very mean thing. Anyway, so then Atisha came, this is a little regression, in the second, beginning of the second millennium. And he, when he taught Tantra, which he taught, he taught a famous book about the stages of path, actually, to prepare a person for Tantra because he was in love with Tantra himself, uh, Ajisha was. He was a Bengali prince from the royal family of Bengal, and, um, but he became a great yogi and adept before he became a monk. And then some, some, some Dakinis came one night in a dream that he had, a bunch of Dakinis, and they said, we hear you like Tantra prince, Ajisha. Uh, we hear that you like Tantra. Would you like to know about some more Tantra? He said, oh yeah, I really like Tantra. I'm already an expert. He said, well here, we have a few more for you. And they brought in a giant tre chest, like the biggest chest, bigger than like this, bigger than this. And they brought a huge chest in there, and then they said, take a look, and they opened the cover in the dream, and then he looked in there, and there were thousands of books in there, and he, didn't, he had never even heard of the titles. <laughs> so then, he was very humbled by that, you know, by those documents. And so then they, they, he said, well, how can I learn about all of these things? And they said, well, stop fooling around as a prince, thinking you're a great yogi, and go be a monk and get serious. So then they actually got him to go be a monk, and he did that. But he was also a tantric addict. So anyway, but he did say when he came to Tibet, because in Tibet at that time, Buddhism was being renewed there. There were a bunch of kind of fake gurus who came from India. They were doing like blood sacrifices, which put them really 
really up to life, you know, sacrificing animals, and I don't know, maybe the people, maybe that's an exaggeration, but they were like Temple of Doom type of yogis. And people didn't know any better, so they were following them. So Adisha was a little strict, and he said that monks should only take the vows initiation of the four major initiations in a, in a high tantra. They should not take the vows initiation and not take the secret initiation. And they shouldn't try unexcelled yoga tantra, the highest, or ati tantra, ati yoga tantra, as they say in England. They shouldn't do that, unless they decide to resign from being a monk and then become a yogi. Because that will involve some kind of a sexual athletic yoga, but not normal sexuality. So, this is, so that's where I started. So then uh, I mentioned that in India there was one great yogi who was also a great Dokchen teacher. His name was Buddha Sri Jnanapada, Sanji Yishi Shah. And he, t he had a famous book called The Revelation, The Direct Revelation of Manjushri, who was an important uh, divine bodhisattva of wisdom and uh, of that subtle body tantra, etc. Manjushri Bukhara. And then he writes in there that, that uh, it was very common that highly developed monks in India would not want to en engage in a partner, uh, you know, uh, and they lived in Manai monastery where there were not, no females anyway, and um, in India. And, uh, so, and they wanted to keep their monk vow until death. So they became tantric adepts, but they waited to keep, reach a certain stage of what is called the perfection stage until they, at the point of death, and then at the point of death, they would leave the body and in a, in a sort of subtle body, or sometimes within the view of their disciples, they would take a consort who would come like an angelic being in a subtle body form, and then they would go through these other stages of the central channel, um, the four blisses, the four voids. It's, a, it's very technically laid out what they do. And um, they would do that, and it was very interesting. Zongkaba himself, the great monk Zongkaba, who lived in the 15th century and who really pretty comprehensively taught uh, a lot of the technolo technologies coming from India. He also waited for that and he, uh, he had, uh, everyone saw him, his body turned to 16 years of age from 60 something and then, he, and then uh, and this sort of magic body, his ordinary body was there in this sort of clear light sitting still. As many of the Tibetan yogis even today, when they die, their body will sit for a week or two, sometimes longer, without falling over without any corruption or decay. It's called sitting in clear light, two thumbs. And uh, Dalai Lama wants the, the scientists to study that with, his, uh, with their fMRIs and go there. He has a team, a SWAT team of scientists who will go when the Lama dies. But he's very frustrated because he's afraid they won't get there in time because they don't know exactly where the Lama is going to die. No. So then he makes a joke, like, I don't think I can ask them to schedule it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, they have begun to do that, and, uh, because it, is, it defies material science that a dead body will sit there. Nothing, no fluid will emerge from the nostrils, will not fall over, will not smell like any kind of rot. It just sits there, and for a number of days, and for some of them weeks, even, and, and even more. This is without mummification. Sometimes they will mummify someone who is like that afterwards, the, themselves, the monks, <coughs> like Fifth Dalai Lama, or don't come by himself, but um, the coarse body, they will mummify. But that's without mummification, it will still sit for weeks or months sometimes. So then I mentioned that Atisha's state was wiped out. Now, in Tantra, in unexcelled yoga tantra, there are two main stages uh, in, the, in the what's called the new tantra, the new way of teaching tantra, meaning new from 1100, from, from 1000. Uh, versus old from the Gurus in time, but they're really good, not good, very different. But anyway, in, the, in those things, in that, what they call it unexcelled yoga tantra, it's what's called the creation stage and the perfection stage. I, I, some people think development and completion, which I don't like. They call it creation stage and perfection stage. And the creation stage yoga is a visualization type of yoga of people who already understand um, some level of renunciation, that is, they are not complete victims of their unconscious impulses. They already understand how the unconscious mind and its instincts work. They encounter their own eros and that adult, you know, their own love and death, and uh, subconscious energy. And so they already have changed that. They have the bodhisattva vow. They have already decided that they are already immortal. There's no way out of life. And therefore, and not only is there no way out of life, but there's no way out of entanglement with every other being that has no way out of life. 
And so you're already stuck for eternity with other beings. You know, you die many times and you're reborn again in different forms. And so therefore it makes sense that you want all of the beings to be free of suffering because you're entangled with all of them. So you know, for Bodhisattva, it, on the basis of seeing life like that, you know, as this continuum of infinite energy, you know, then you don't want that infinite energy to go on in a bad way and have to suffer and have others suffering around you to follow it. So that's the, that's the reasoning underlying the Bodhisattva vow. You know what I mean? The people, if you go to American Zen centers or even Tibetan centers, some of them, all the students will say, yeah, I have Bodhisattva vow. And they say, well, do you think you have a future life? Oh, no, I don't have that. That's an old-fashioned, I'm a modern person, scientific. I don't have any future life. So how do you going to save old beings from suffering if you have no time? <laughs> and then, well, I just say it. So they think that's a Bodhisattva vow. So you can't even take a Bodhisattva vow unless you have already realized that you're already immortal. And, and the way you're immortal, the, the way you think you're immortal now, is not that much fun. So that's why you say, I don't want to be immortal. Actually, there was a great movie. Did you ever see that movie? Sigourney Weaver was in it, a bunch of actresses. Uh, Goldie Hawn. And it was called, um, I forgot what it's called, but they, they go in some place in Hollywood and they drink some, something they thought was a cocktail. And then they can't die. But they could get injured and their neck broken, and so then they're dragging their bodies around in a horrible way, and they're looking for a way to die because they, they uh, it's called Death Becomes Her. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a funny movie. You know, the, the wrong kind of immortality. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they're mortally sick. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so anyway, so, so that's a, okay, next. So then, uh, the most important thing was in the perfection stage. This is the key point in the perfect stage, is that the sexual, you see, the whole point of attaining Buddhahood is you discover that your body is made of light. And you live from the point of view of where you're consciously aware at the pre-molecular level of life. And you identify with all life. So you should, you don't even have a body by any kind of impulse. But you can shape a body out of any kind of energy. You can shape anything out of any energy, but you are fused with all energy, for the benefit, which you only do for the benefit of any other being. So that's what you're trying to do, as a, you're trying to change your coarse body into a light body. Or rather, we actually have light bodies already, you know, because what are the subatomic products of the molecules in our own wetware, in our flesh and blood and bone? What is that? What is that? You know, what, if you take your own finger and bone and flesh and blood and lymph and throw it into an electron accelerator, it will dissolve on your house, it will disappear, you know, and there will be flashes of light as electrons collide with each other, and then the subatomic particles, you know, they have charge and twist and spin and all the weird things named, and then they disappear. Even the Higgs boson that they supposedly discovered last year, they were thrilled they finally had discovered something that had mass, they thought they discovered see the mass, but it's nothing but indirect inference from one thing exploding on another. They never found the Higgs boson. Hey, here's the Higgs boson. And now I know why we have volume. Here's the boson. And then, and then, the matter that they can see in their theory, they keep escaping from the fact that they don't know what they're doing. All the matter they see is only 3% of the matter of the universe. And there's 27% dark energy and 70% dark matter, which they've never seen. Because it's dark. But they just theorize that it's there. So they feel you know, better stick to the older science stuff. Well, you're absolutely right. They're going to find the dark energy. Maybe they're building bigger and bigger machines. But it's dark, so you can't see it. <laughs> it's open to theory, actually. Because they, they, they try to figure out how to control everything without being responsible for their own mind. Because they want to have to stick to the theory that they don't have one. Which is the way they escape from. Jonathan Edwards and the, and the preachers scaring the Christian preachers scaring them from hell. <laughs> Seriously, it's as childish as that. And I'm sorry, but that's the fact. <laughs> so my point is this: the way, that, the only time when you have this kind of bliss of merging with the clear light, normally, is when you die. That everyone will have that experience, consciously, for a split second. But you will not. You'll be so nervous at the idea of you not having a boundary body that you will immediately go looking for a boundary body. Your energy flow will want a new boundary body, so that's how you get reborn. And and uh, you, so you kind of don't notice that passage through clear light. What's called clear light of the void. Okay. 
And the other one is you have a hint of it in orgasm, in sexual experience. You have a hint of it. But only a hint because the bindu, you know, the subtle essence, essential fluids in the body, the, the, the semen and the ovum, as they call it, which is not just the phlegm and the things, it's the essence of the, that fertile blood and the fertile, the fertile seed. And uh, when those things, uh, they, they ejaculate, they, they go outside. And uh, of the of the body, and or they go and they go out of the nervous system of the female and into the womb. So, so therefore, they don't get go up into the central channel because, as I said, central channel is pinched off like that thing I showed you last night. But that still is something that reminds people of that. And then, what the highest tantra yoga basically is, is where the two, to avoid having to die and completely leave the coarse body and then work only in a subtle plane because they want to stay connected to the human body and the society to help others do things. In order to do that, they have to be in what they call father-mother union. And father-mother is something that they never translate. These guys are trying to say it's some horrible thing. They go male-female. But there's a different word for male-female in Tibetan or Sanskrit. But they say father-mother. So we, but the, 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 the guys who want to make it a bad thing don't like that because, you know, what is this father-mother? I once had a friend who was a big psychiatry guy and a professor, and we were doing a thing, and I mentioned this sort of thing, he said, oh my, I showed him a yabul, you know, sculpture on a slide like this. And he said, oh my God. He said, yeah, and there was a, it was a context of a course where a woman was doing female theology and why is God male, all this thing, you know, one of those things that people do. And then he said, neither God female only, neither God male only, but God is the primal scene. <laughs> you know, primal scene, is a Freudian idea, where the little kid runs into the bedroom where mom and daddy are having sex, and then freaks out and is neurotic for life. <laughs> but, but in Buddhism, in the Bardo, you're attracted to your parents because you see them having sex. Right? And then if you're going to be male, you like the woman. If you're, if you're going to be female, you like the male. And then you merge with them, and then, yeah, and then you're reborn. So you already had an animal experience or an electro experience before you could see or the put it to So they're not really that freak out. So, so, but this guy, what's he? And I said to him, I said, Bob, God the primal seed, how about a grown-up culture? No. Okay, so, 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 so in other words, the non-emission is the proof of this not ordinary sexuality. Meaning, the big experience is when they're in union, and, they, and even without being in union, just visualizing where the, the essential fluids, the essence of the fertile blood, the essence of the fertile semen, go inside the central channel. It's a feeling like an ejaculation, but, or an orgasm, female orgasm, but it goes inside. It goes to the navel chakra, then to the heart chakra, then to the throat chakra, then to the brain chakra. And these are called, in the, the four more, there are five chakras, right? So moving one to another four times. But sometimes they're called the four pieces, and they connect to what are called the four voids. Or the four empties, some terrible people with I don't know, like four voids. So, you know, it's a great voidness, ecstatic voidness, etc. You there are different names for it, and different kinds of blisses. And the highest bliss is the orgasmic bliss, and that is when the, it goes in the brain. But then it can go from brain to throat, so it goes down as well. And then actually there's a final thing where it goes into different layers in the very complicated heart chakra. That's like the most far out thing. Because that's where you find the subtle body. Okay, so I'm jumping ahead on that. But I don't, and I'm going to go to the... I'm going to skip some of these things. And so here you see. Seal, con, they call them seals. And by seal they mean like when you seal with wax something to leave an impression in it. So the male female are each other's seals. Also the other thing is that a female who is practicing, say, <clears throat> you know, uh, high tantra of, um, you know, um, the esoteric, like that picture here is an esoteric form of Amitaya, so the infinite life put on male female form. But when a female does it, she can visualize herself as a male. She doesn't always have to visualize herself as a female. And, and both male, female and male can visualize themselves as both members of the couple, actually, in, in meditative practice. And they have such a powerful, stable mind by the time they reach these advanced things that they really come to feel that way. And the whole purpose of the visualization thing in the mandala is 
where you don't even see ordinary tables and ordinary people. You see everyone as divine, you see the table as divine, you completely have flipped over into, you have shifted because of knowing the emptiness of everything, the voidness of it, that everything can be reconstructed by imagination. Your imagination is empowered by one point of concentration. So you actually see, you don't see this building with plastic roof tiles and glass windows and wood, wood and seat rock and whatever, wood floor, bamboo wood floor. You see it as made of jewel, like a jewel hologram. You actually do see that because your mind reinterprets everything. You know? Like what we, I guess, some of you might know. You know, you can. Uh, uh, they, they have analyzed how you see something. Like when you see the floor, it's not like the floor just presents itself objectively to you. What is you? you some light hits some surface. And the photons from the light come and interact with the neurons in your brain, in your eye, optic nerve. And then your brain produces your idea of a floor, and with the you know, stripes and that move, however much you know about floors. And then it goes and it excludes some of those lights and, and it organizes other, and it organizes it into a perception where you see floor. So you're actually imagining that floor, as well as something that's, some light is interacting with your nervous system at a very subtle level. Right? I mean, that's not a mystery to anybody. You're all aware of that kind of thing, are you? It doesn't seem like, and we, if, we, if we do that, if we had to do that consciously all the time, of course, it would be a long time with a uh, floor, take forever to do it. But the fact is, therefore, that the imagination is constructing the seemingly solid appearance of the floor. So the creation stage in Tantra is where you have become such a master of your imagination and your subtle mental processes that you can take that, you can intervene in that place where the brain pulls up the concept of the image of a floor and splatters it over to, and puts it outside, like it did with this car, out there. And uh, it does that with a jewel place, a jewel mansion, which you memorize entirely the architecture and the wall ornamentation and the, the clothing ornamentation. You memorize your body, maybe you have four arms, three faces, etc., six arms, three faces. You, and you have a consort who's that. You are both of them, maybe sometimes. Sometimes both of you are doing it if you have a, if you have an actual partner in the yoga. It's really complicated. It's highly subjectively mobilized neuroscientific experimental research and practice. It's incredibly sophisticated. It's beyond credibility. And we're not we're, we're not surprised at, this, at the sophistication of our astronauts and and people who do you know microbiological thing in those big computers with those super electron microscopes and they do all this stuff you know, at the micro level. But these people do it with their own brain, with their own concentration in their own brain. They did it for millennia. It started in India, mainly, and then spread all over, all over the, the Asia. So, and actually resonated morphically in, with uh, Christian monastics, Sufis, and other Jewish uh, mystics in the West. So it's not like they, they needed Buddhism for it. They all can discover this because it's part of your own body and mind, the way it works. But anyway, so so therefore, this con so it's only necessary from the third perfection stage, it's absolutely necessary. It's not really necessary creation stage, but it can be used. But it, although it's even worse, for example, it's considered better to be a monk to do creation stage, because if you try to do it with an actual female or a female child with an actual male, before having those high levels of stability and having those high initiations and so forth, then it's likely it will deteriorate the ordinary sex. And then that will not help, actually, in developing in this direction. Okay. But it is nece it's necessary to have a partner from the third perfection stage, if you're doing it in life and not in the between state, which is called the mind objective state, the self-consecration or self-initiation state, or the magic body state. It has three names at the three, three stages within the third stage. Uh, Maya day, and some people would say illusion body. I consider that rude. It's a magic body. Okay, so then, but then you have to know this. Do you all know this business, course, subtle and super subtle? Did we talk about it already? Do you all know this? You know it from the Book of the Dead introduction that happened in there. And this is the this is the scheme by which these yogis with which these yogis are working. Which again, it's a relative scheme. It's a scientific scheme about the way our, our bodies and minds work. But it's very useful in this context. And the coarse body mind, you know, it's your sense, six-fold sense consciousness mind. And your coarse body is your flesh and blood body, or the body of your six sense, or your five sense organs, five material sense organs, right? Eye, ear, nose, tongue, and skin. 
right? The touch, touch, uh, touch sense. And, um, and, the, and the mind is the five sense conditions plus the mental condition that picks out one or the other and does that whole complicated imagination thing of matching uh, what we experience sensorially with what we expect to experience and then enabling us to recognize it, which is uh, something that the brain can do. And that's called the mental concept. Then the subtle body mind is the Zalom Tigle, which, or, you know, Bindu, or, or, or Nadi, uh, bin, Nadi, Vayu, and Bindu, which in Sanskrit are Zalom Tigle, which are the neural channels, the energies, and the neurotransmitters, you could say. Um, uh, channels, energies, and wind, winds, and drops. You know, and then the subtle mind is the strange mind of the subconscious, actually, but seen in a certain yogic way where there are three planes in it, a plane of white light, like a moonlit light, a plane of sunlight, like a, like a very strong reddish solar light, orange and reddish solar light, and then a plane of absolute darkness, and uh, it's black that it's so black it's bright. That's the dark energy in dark matter. It's that plane. And they have in them, for the ordinary person, there are 80 instinctual surges, 33, 40, and 7, uh, in those three states, three mind states, which are this white, red, and, and black states. And, um, and this is a bit, I'll, I'll, I'll show you this from another level, but that's called the subtle body mind. And when, the, when one is aware of oneself as a kind of bowl of a network of fibrous uh, channels in which energy moves, uh, sparkling uh, awareness uh, chemicals, uh, then when your physical body is self-consciously aware of that, then at the same time your mind is in this plane of a spacious, vast whiteness. You have no sense of your mind being trapped in sense organs and things. And spacious whiteness, spacious redness, and spacious darkness. And even that's a seeming unconsciousness where you have to um, be kind of, um, con you have to have a meditative stability where being unconscious, you're kind of conscious that you're unconscious. Right? It, it's attainable. But here you're mainly at the last bit you get unconscious. Okay, then there's the super subtle body mind. And this one, although they still say body mind, which are the super subtle physical energies, which are like we like wind, but, but they're subtle wind, they're 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 prana, they're vayu, but they're super subtle. And and actually in their super subtle form they become bliss because they're so super subtle because they are no longer contained in all, and they are sort of diffuse everywhere. They have a sense of feeling infinite, something like that. And the mind is the clear light, this void mind. And so this is put just to fit with our dualistic way of expressing things in language, you know, positive, negative, etc. It's put like body mind, but actually they are one single, one single thing. There's no difference between physical or energetic and mental. There's no difference at this level. And this is the soul level. And uh, a clear light, this void mind. And this level is a level where you, if you are conscious from this level, rather than thinking it's sort of something you pass through, but if you can develop a mind that could be consciously aware of itself at this level, and aware of the universe at this level, that would be the Buddha mind. And you would be a Buddha. It's only, a, we all go through that mind. But when, you, when you're consciously in that mind, you're because consciously being in that mind doesn't obstruct you from consciously being at horse level, solo level, any, any level you want. Because this is the overwhelming level. And again, remember all descriptions of relative reality are hypothetical, best accounting for the experience, the experiments that we've done. Doesn't mean there's some type of absolute thing. Because here you talk body mind, but actually body mind are the same. So the problem that the, web, the materialist scientists have in dialoguing with holiness and with Benton Lamas and other people, where they say, well, we'll try to think of how non-material can relate to material. And he never clips them in, except that they never pick up the clue that it's not a matter of non-material to material, it's a matter of subtle to force. That's the complex, super subtle to force. He doesn't do that. He doesn't let them go back. Then they would say, oh, it means it's all matter. Oh, then we're right. So he never let them go back. <laughs> now this, this you should know. So this, is, this fits with what I just did. Because this is the ordinary process of death. When you die, you see, there, there's four stages of getting out of your coarse body. Almost out, but you're in, still in your subtle body for the 
six, six, and seven. The one through four, you're getting out of your subtle thought, your coarse thought. And the first one is where your eyesight dims. And what you have when you lose the ability to recognize things that you see, you, you, your brain hallucinates and tries to throw up every image you can think of that it might be this, might be that, this, the, the things that are still affecting my neuron, my optic nerve. So that's called earth to water. So that's where you move from love to compassion. You know? And uh, in the one we were talking about last night. And then the second one is water to fire. And you feel like you're in, you know, everything is smoke or clouds around you. And it's a little bit, not much, not, you begin to feel a little warm. Water is kind of cool and cold. Then the third one is fire to wind. And the, and the sign of that is a swirling of hatching fireflies. Have you ever seen that? I saw it once in Japan in my life, under a bridge, in full moon. The swirling fireflies just hatching, you know. It's amazing. You know? <laughs> Another thing is like a moray pattern. A moray pattern, if you, know, you drop a couple of pebbles in a, in a still pond, and the different uh, ripples hit each other, and then they make a kind of pattern like that. So it's a, another sign. We, or, or sparks in a fire, sparks shooting out of it. But it's not usually that rough, so fireflies are like this little green light rather than spark. Because fire is cooling itself into the wind. And you know, these are just general uh, images that, are, that have arisen in a lot of people, which the conscious ones, the yogis, who stay conscious to this proper, report back that you have things like that. So it doesn't necessarily have to be exactly a firefly or exactly this, that, because there are different patterns that can occur. Then when you come to the fourth one, that's wind to space or wind to pure consciousness. So that's where you lose a sense of boundary, your normal skin, your boundary body at the fourth stage when you die, right? But then you're still inside the body as a sens sensitive structure of channels, winds, and movements, channels, and movements, and, and, and drops. And so, it's, but you're still, that's why the consciousness is still in a body who seems to have died. At the fourth stage, your surgeon or your doctor in a regular hospital would consider you dead because you wouldn't be breathing at all. You already you stop breathing in normal breath at this point, about in one through four, during one through four. And they describe quite in detail one through four, and, and uh, I'll, I'll have another slide, I'll show that. And, um, uh, okay, and then the final one is the transparency, or it means clear light. And clear light is called light, but, ourselves, but it's not really light in the sense that it's not the opposite of darkness. The lights are the moonlit sunlight of the subtle mind. Then their, their opposite is the darkness. But clear light is a kind of transparency where everything has self-luminance, so there's no shadows, and there's no obstruction, and there's no subject-object duality. So when you hit that, you're everywhere. You're Buddha. You're, you're one with everything and everyone. But in a way, since you're not prepared for it, you just you feel frightened that you're sort of you're disappearing, and you're gonna you're gonna be never exist anymore. You have a primal fear of that. So, and you don't remember that nothing is nothing, okay? and so you you scramble to sort of try to reassert some sort of uh, you know boundary in the self where you you are I'm, I'm this and I'm not all that, and that's what then pushes you beyond that to and you then you go in that between state. It's like you rise in a dream out of a state of unconsciousness, really, and then the dream you have a form, and then you look for a form to stabilize that form. The dream form is very unstable. That's the normal rebirth process, right? But the yogi goes out, and then this is the place they're looking for, this one, to be consciousness in transparency or clear light. Because it's just, and then this connects to a concept that modern physicists have discovered, which they call the quantum vacuum infinite energy uh, field or something like that, where mathematically a, a vacuum has infinite energy. Once, you have, once there's infinite energy present somewhere, then it's not doing anything by itself because it doesn't need to, because everything's already done. But on the other hand, it can be drawn from infinitely by a being that can be conscious of that thing. Okay? So this is again elaborating a little more that, you know, how in those first four things, you see first your visual thing goes, then your hearing goes, then your smelling goes, and then your touch and taste goes. You know, you go numb, like when you die, you know, you can no longer have no motor nerve and everything. And all these things happen. And your aggregates dissolve in that sort of same sequence. They have it really well organized. Their schemes are very, very well organized. 
and what I do when you go to this is detail. And then this one, the next one, is uh, where you, this, that's how the instincts lie for the unenlightened person. So in a way, they sometimes when they die, they wouldn't necessarily see the moonlit sky or the, or the sunlit sky or the dark sky because they would be filled with these surges. Oh, 33 that are connected to lust, 40 connected to aggression or hostility, and fear of paranoia and anger, and seven that are kind of like stupidity and dullness. So that's Eros and Thanatos and Hypnos, with the Greek god of, of, um, of uh, sleep. So within such a schema, so, that, okay, so that, that's giving you a rough idea of the sort of structure of, of consciousness and life and death that these yogis are working with. And coming back to the sexuality thing, Same what did thing. I say? Within such a schema, perfection stage yogi, and I write it like this yogi or yogi ni because I don't want to presume it's always a male doing it, seeks to constantly traverse these dissolution stages without dying. An ordinary person does traverse them fully when dying to a lesser extent in orgasm, supposedly, but unconsciously, more or less. So I, we, we already described that. So, Tenzi, we can we take some questions before we break for lunch? What? We take some quick questions before we break no, for lunch? No, we can't. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm, I'm finishing a little bit here. Uh, death is defined here as the moment when clear light, non-dual wind energy mind is reached. It is also called this void indivisible, neto yemeva, in Tibetan. Or, or sukha shunya, your mahasukha spa is based on this concept of sukha, bliss. This word is This happens when the consciousness abandons its links with coarse matter of atoms, like the four, which are you know, expressed as the four elements and goes down through the three luminances, as I call them, the moonlit, sunlit, and darklit, toward clear light, the sunlit state. In the rebirth process schema, consciousness comes back up as too insecure feeling an inconceivable, infinite, unboundary, timeless, clear light. So used to being a separate individual, we are so used to being a separate individual with boundaries interacting with the other environment of beings and things, and the instinct-driven between-state being adopts a dreamlike imagined body that shifts with emotions and hallucinations until a wound, egg, moisture, or lotus is found, lotus in a new body or a new species. The perfection stage yogi or yogini, who has a stabilized consciousness with mental concentration of samadhi, embraces this dissolution process, remains conscious throughout it, enjoys the clear light of this void and divisible because it's such a him or her, it's an infinite orgasm, basically. They see the world is made of infinite and because of compassion, love, of bodhicitta, messianic overflow, comes back because of the bodhisattva vow, because otherwise there's no reason to return from the infinite clear light where you're consciously part of it. There's no, you're not driven to do it by anything. You're also it's infinite energy. So you don't need to do anything for anybody, but your sensitivity remains complete, so you do feel those who are there, who you see them as pure clear light for themselves. They're all blissful. They're made of bliss. But they are pissed off. They don't feel blissful. They are unhappy. They're causing each other harm. They're causing themselves harm. So you're aware of that. So from that, you then might develop yourself into a body to do something for them. That's what, what that's the infinite compassion of the Bodhisattva, Buddha, of the Bodhisattva, always constant. So then you come back up to the boundary between luminance and space consciousness. Okay? Going back a second. You come back to this boundary, you see luminance to radiance, consciousness, well, this is in the death process. But you come back, you, you can't, you don't come back because you stay here with the clear light. But you can manifest a form to go up here to consciousness, to luminance, to that point. And then you can consciously go into something that's like a between state body. But now you have become such a powerful yogi that you visualize yourself like this couple. So you visualize yourself like that, or like a three, like Louis Samaja with three faces and six arms, or like some other kinds of these made, many different kinds of, of yidam, what they call, or chosen deity. And then as that, you can arise in, the, in a subtle body and go all over the universe and do a lot of meritorious and wonderful things for people, and sort of rehearse being a Buddha, rehearse having an emanation body, and, and, which is like Star Trek. You know, you like go down to a grade two planet where they're hitting each other with clubs, you know, and you beat down. You don't have to interfere, you can't interfere too dramatically, you're going to freak out. 
But you beat one or two of them up and you give them a little yoga teaching and you send them back. And then they go, no, don't hit me. <laughs> and they try to, so you try to help the evolution of plants. It's very, very sci-fi. It's an ancient Buddhist view, but very sci-fi. Star Trek is approximating it, actually. That's why people like it. And uh, so then, uh, you know, so, the, so at that point, the alien sinful drives, so Eros, Thanatos, and Hypnos are not in control. The self embodiment is a divine body of Kal Chakra, we have some other one thing, or you know, um, uh, uh, whoever it is, a very numerous Sista Devata forms, depending on the attendance of persons to do that. Then you arise in a magic body, Mahadeha, like a consciously constructed between being embodiment, and they then visit other worlds accumulate merit by also returning and plunging again and again into clear light transparency. And magic bodies most often a father union, mother, mother union, it seems. And why? Now this one. So this one, maybe we have to come back to it because maybe we can't at this point either Justin or the books infinitely. <laughs> so this slide I will come back and spend more time with. It's really quite a lot of material here. I, I don't want to rush through it, and it actually really is very interesting, I must admit. I got quite interested in doing this one. And I will talk more about that. But basically, just in short. One reason you need father mother body. Now, the father mother body of a yogi who's doing this, either two of them or one of them, it just doesn't matter. I mean, but it's harder to do with just one, because you have to visualize that one. But it could be, so it could be two partners, but in that case, both partners are at the same level of development. You can't just grab any other person over anywhere who doesn't know anything. They, they will just want ordinary sexuality. They won't be able to sit like that, stay like that in a certain kind of luck. But both partners are in a lock, what the, they would call cataleptic trance, where they're either like in hibernation state, where they're, they're not breathing actually normally, but they're taking enough oxygen to stay alive. They're not having any no corruption in their body. They're, they're staying in this trance state. And then when the person comes back from the magic body, in fact, so they haven't reached all the way, because there's a long further purification of the magic body thing. But they come back and they see their own body as either the female or the male in the couple as a set of parents in union. And they then go just like in the Bardo, they go into the mouth of the father or the crown uh, chakra of the father through the top of the skull, down through the central channel, into the womb of the mother. And then somehow from the womb of the mother, they then reoccupy their body at the heart chakra level either as the female or the male, depending on which one they are. So they need a set of parents there to attract them back from just more or less flying in the clear light where they're in much greater bliss than when you're constrained by the ordinary brain and body. So, so that's why they call it father-mother, because you become your own father-mother. It's really something. That's the nine mergers, sevabu. That's elaborated in a system called the nine mergers, sevabu, where you have the merger of the death clear light, Sleep clear light and samadhi clear light. You have the merger of the bardo uh, consciousness, this clear, the, the sambodhakaya, the body of the attitude of a Buddha, and the uh, dream body. Then you have the merger of the waking body, the emanation body of a Buddha, and um, I don't know if I forgot something. But meditation, I can't remember which one. Waking body. Waking body. Sleep waking. So that then, then when you really become a yogi, this, when you sleep, you go into the clear light of death. And you practice deep plunging into clear light. In a dream, you practice the magic body yoga. When you're waking, you practice emanation body. So you know, it, it, it more and more merges everything together as you go along. But to come back from the subtle level to the coarser level, which a yogi does out of compassion for people in that society, and so on, they need a set of parents, and the parents are their own body and their and, and their consort's body. It's really very very amazing. Okay, that's enough. Let's go have lunch. Questions, I think we'll have it in another session. And I will